people that they were really blessed and uh, needed that. And I, I'm glad for that. I really am. Um, to me, this is, this is Christianity 101. I mean, it really is. It's, it's a very simple way to understand God. I mean, I believe we see God. Hey, buddy, how you doing? I believe we see God in nature, okay? Because this is his creation. So if you look and notice nature, you'll understand God. And Romans 1 tells us that. For the invisible things of the creation can be seen. You know, you can see the creator in the creation. His signature is everywhere. And one of the things that we know, and we don't ponder it much, but think of the seasons and the cycles of life. And everything has those seasons and cycles. Everything that God made, everything that God created, it goes that way. And so God, that's God's signature on it. And I noticed, if you know, going back to Ecclesiastes 1, that everything related to time is a circle. Look at your watch. Okay, it goes around in a circle from 12 to 12 to 12 to 12 to 12. Or for the military, 12 to 24 to 12 to 24. But it's a circle. Uh, the seasons and the, and the sky above us go in a circle. It's a very slow circle. The moon goes in a circle. The sun goes in a circle. And everything about time is a circle. That's why he, he gave us the illustration of water. And it flows down there. And we understand this because all this rain that we get, where did it come from? It came from here. It started out here, ran down the Mississippi, down the Gulf of Mexico. Then it stayed there. And those, those warm waters churned up all that hurricane flooding and wind and brought it back up to the state of Missouri and drop that water down again in the same place that it came from to begin with. It flows back in the Mississippi River, down the Gulf of Mexico, comes back up over the Midwest, and all the rivers from the Rocky Mountains to the Appalachian Mountains run where? Mississippi River, which is right over here. I mean, we get all of that water right back on us, and it mostly comes from the same place, the Gulf of Mexico. A lot of, sometimes it'll come out of the Pacific, Okay, but, but even that goes in a circle as well. There, there are circles of rivers that run through the ocean. They call them ocean currents. The shipping lanes are devised on those currents. And back in the days when they floated sailing ships with literal sails, if they got out of those currents and they got out of the wind currents, they were in what they called the doldrums. And people had those. You ever had the doldrums where the wind wasn't blowing? And it was just like nothing was going on, okay? When those ships that sailed and by wind, they, when they got in those spots, they didn't know what to do. So a lot of times they had to get the guys out with oars and row that boat literally into either a current in the ocean or a wind to blow the sails. But they were relying on air movement and water movement to do this. Or I'm going the wrong way, okay? But anyway, time is a circle. So what the biggest thing that he's teaching here in Ecclesiastes 1 is the thing that hath been is the thing that shall be. So you look back in the cycle of your life. Did God save you? Yes. Will God pull you out and save you again? Yes. Now, I don't believe you're saved twice and born again and born again and born again. But I'm talking about the same thing that God did for you 20 times in the past is what he's going to do again for you. Because he's the same God, and he never changes, does he? Never changes. So when you start looking in Scripture, you can see those cycles. In Judges, and I'm not going to go through the book of Judges, but in Judges, they, if you read the book of Judges, you'll see they were constantly going in that cycle. When God would send a judge... God would strengthen him. He would put down the enemies. He would destroy the king that was over them, the cruel authority. And God would bring revival. 
Somebody asked about revival today. Now, I don't know a magic word that you can say and God sends revival. I don't know of one and I don't believe that there is one. What I know is when God is ready to bring it, He brings it. And you don't even have to do anything. It's just there. Let me ask you a question. How did you wake up this morning? I woke up before my alarm went off. Have you ever done that? Your body gets in a rhythm, doesn't it? And you don't even set the alarm sometimes and you wake up same time. But how did your body do that? God designed it to wake up at a certain time. Just like the day when God came in my office and said, Mike, this Bible is right. Okay? I, did, I wasn't asking for that one. I wasn't seeking that out. And I didn't say something that made God do that. He decided at that time that that's when he was going to do it. And he did it. Okay? And then, did I have doubts after that? Sure I did. And then God answered those doubts. And then I, I would hear some other preacher say something and that would bring some doubt in my mind again. And God would give me more. But every time God's doing that with me concerning this Bible, I'm getting stronger in it. Okay? And I'm to the point now, you're not, you're not cutting this tree down. This tree ain't going nowhere. Okay? It just keeps getting stronger and stronger and stronger. But the key to revival is ask, wait, wait. How did you know when to get saved? How did you know? God showed up one day and saved you, didn't he? But he did it in his time, in his season, in his way. Okay, so now let me show you how, the, what the process was in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, they call it the Sermon on the Mount. <clears throat> they call this the Beatitudes, what I'm going to give you. And I've said this many times before, when you're blessed, blessed is a salvation word. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Okay, if you are cursed... That's the opposite of it. You cannot be blessed and cursed simultaneously. You, it's not possible. If God blesses you with salvation, nobody and no devil can curse you to take that salvation away. It's not, this doesn't happen. You're blessed, you're blessed. Okay? So think of somebody now who doesn't know anything about the Lord. Think about the day that you got saved. And where you were spiritually. All right. So verse one, seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him and he opened his mouth and taught them saying, and I'm going to read this and we'll go pray. And then I'm going to go through it. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn for they should be comforted. Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Now I'm going to read verse 12 as part of that. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they, the prophets, which were before you. There's your answer right there. Now let's go to the Lord, we'll pray, and we'll ask God to teach us some great and mighty things. This, and I will be honest with you, as, as part of God teaching me about cycles, the second sermon I ever heard Reg Kelly preach, he started out, with about 20 minutes of this showing the cycles. And I'm just going, how did God know that I needed that? 
Okay? It just floored me because I was still angry with him. I didn't like him very much. But God was working, all right? So anyway. Father, I love you. Thank you, God, for teaching us. Thank you, God, for giving us a heart that's willing to learn, willing to be open, God, to what you have to say. Help us, dear God, to forsake man's doctrine, man's teachings, man's ways. Let's just listen to you. Lord, it's a joy when you teach us, when you work in our hearts, when you purify us and our motives, God, when you pull us out of the pit. Lord, it's a joy. And Father, help us to understand that when persecution arises, that's our salvation, that's our blessing. Help us to see it that way. Fill us with a good spirit, Lord, so we understand, God, that that's how you work in our lives and our hearts to purify us. Work in us, God, these things we pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. Now watch this. If you count this, starting in verse 3, blessed are the poor, blessed are they that mourn, blessed are the meek, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst, blessed are the merciful, blessed are the pure in heart, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Verse 11, blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you. How many fingers do I have holding up here? Nine. What is nine the number of? Fruit bearing. Fruit of the Spirit. This is how God manifests this, not how you do it. Again, there is not a work, a magic word, a ritual, something that the church pours on you, puts in you, touches you with, hits you with. There's nothing that the church or man does to do this in you, this is the work of God. We are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Who does the works? God does. When does He do it? When He's good and ready. When, he's, when He feels like it. When He knows it's the right season. How did, not, how did God know when to send Jesus the first time? How did God, how will God know when to send Jesus the second time? He's got it in his mind, in his heart, how he's going to do it, what he's going to do. Jesus, they're standing with, with his disciples in Acts chapter 1, and they're saying, are you going to bring the kingdom in now? You've resurrected from the dead. We believe in you now. Are you going to bring us the kingdom now? And he said, those things are in the Father's hand. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to Jerusalem and wait. Wait on what? Just wait for the promise of the Father. Just wait. Well, okay, what you, you want us to run around? You want us to, and I, I'm getting that from a, a church that I heard about down, way down in the country, down around Richwoods. Kevin Pogue told me this, one of them Pentecostal crazy head churches where they started the service, they, they literally running around the building. Somebody said, what are y'all doing? We're bringing in the Holy Ghost. That's what they thought. They thought if they ran around like that, the Holy Ghost would show up in there. You, ne you read this Bible, and then you name for me one thing that you do to initiate God's presence. He shows up when he wants to. Amen? He does it in his time, his way, his season, and he's telling you to wait. What do you think all of that's for? It's to find out who really wants it and who doesn't. So if I put an ad in the paper and said, I've got a million dollars, I'm a rich millionaire, I've got a million dollars to give away, I want everybody to show up. The biggest place in Festus we can find, maybe this football field here in town, I want everybody to show up to the football field and I will pick the right person to give the million dollars to. So let's say 10,000 people show up out there at the football field. And I'm not giving it away yet. After about a few hours, what are people going to do? And walk away. After about six hours, what are they going to do? More of them's going to walk away. Ten hours, they're going to walk away. Twelve hours, they're going to walk away. Finally, I'm going to wait 23 hours. There's five people left. I give them each a million dollars. They waited. They waited. And that's what God told those disciples to do. Watch this now. Okay, so let's, let's get some... 
Let's get this. You're lost. You don't know anything about Christ. You don't know anything about salvation. You're lost. You're in a poor condition. Now watch this. Number, number one, verse three. Blessed are the poor in spirit. You at that point are spiritually bankrupt. You have a debt of sin that you owe to God that you cannot physically pay back and you know it. Or else you think, as long as you think your good deeds are going to make points with God, you will never be poor in spirit. You'll never reach that point. You'll never get to the point to where you're going to let God take over your life. It's at the point where you realize you are bankrupt. You cannot pay off the debt of sin that you acquired. And you found out that there is one who offers to pay your debt. And that's Jesus Christ. So he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is what? What's God got in heaven? Streets made of gold. Gates of pearl. God's got money. He's rich. He's wealthy. He's got everything for you. And you say, I want that. So number one, God picks you up, blesses you. You're bankrupt. You can't pay the debt. And God said, the blood of Christ has eliminated your sin debt. You are free. Amen. What did you do for it? Nothing. What did you perform? Nothing. Did you make a promise? God, I'll, I'll be good the rest of my life. Nothing. Because you have nothing to give. You have nothing to offer. Can you pay a debt when you have no money? If you owed a penny to somebody, you couldn't pay it back because you don't have a penny. That's the point of it. And that's why God made all those laws in the Old Testament was to make sure that you realize that you're not just bankrupt. You are bankrupt. Bad bankrupt. And you're never going to be able to pay it back. So that's number one. Second thing he does. Now God's going to start picking you up. Blessed are they that what? Mourn. Mourning has to do with death. You realize that you are dead in trespasses and sins, the Bible says. You are also dead to this world. And you're mourning over your sins. Anybody that ever comes and says, well, I just think I want to receive Jesus today. I'm just so excited about it. That's fake. And I don't buy it. When you got saved, you mourned. I was nine years old and I was weeping. Crying at an altar over my sins. Because I knew I was guilty. I knew things I'd done. And I was unrighteous before God. Blessed are they that mourn. For they shall be what? What does that word mean? What's it related to? The Holy Spirit and the Bible. What's God going to give you now? What has He given you? He's given you the Holy Ghost. He's put His Spirit in you. Whatever that is, turn it off. All right. He's given you the Holy Ghost. He's comforting you. You're mourning over your sins. And God says, he's caressing you. And he says, don't worry about it. I got it all paid. It's all taken care of. And all of a sudden now you receive the Holy Ghost. And you just know inside that you're clean. Amen? Then what's the third thing he does? Blessed are the meek. What is meekness? It's not weakness. It is yielding. Your rights. We have rights in this country, don't we? Are we going to fight for them? Yep. What if God were to say, don't? I have a better way. Only God's people would yield to that. Let me give you biblical examples. Lot and Abraham. Abraham owned everything. Lot he had taken in because his father had died. So Lot was under Abraham's authority. Gave him sheep. Gave him servants. And all of a sudden now in Genesis 13. The servants of Lot and the servants of Abraham. Are fighting one another over wells. Water and grass. For their cattle. 
And their herdsmen they're, are fighting. Their servants are fighting. And Abraham goes to Lot. Now, Abraham has a right to tell Lot, get away from me. You tell your guys, knock it off or I'll kill them. He has a right to do that. But what did he do? He yielded over his rights. He showed biblical meekness. And Abraham says to Lot, Lot, you, go with, you just take whatever you want. If you go this way, I'm going to go this way. Now, if you want to go this way, then I'll go that way. Whichever way you go, I'm going to go the other way. The Bible says Lot chose the well-watered plains of Sodom. Lot lost everything. God took Abraham. Genesis 13, you go read it. God said, now look northward, southward, eastward, and westward. That's a continuous line. And he said, everything that your eyes lay hold on is yours. I'm giving it to you and to your seed for all perpetual generations. Look at what that says. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit what? The earth. When you yield to God, you will inherit greater things than what you fight for against God. Blessed are the meek. See, what, what God has to do is break your will. Amen? Is he's breaking you. He's taking you and making you a different person than you used to be. Now, what's the next one? Blessed are they what? Verse 6. Which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. Blessed are they, for they shall be filled. Before... Before verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, you loved sin. Sin was fun. If sin wasn't fun, nobody would sin. If sin didn't feel good, taste good, smell good, act good, look good, if sin wasn't good at all, we wouldn't be doing it. If it wasn't tempting and tantalizing, we wouldn't have no part of it. And when we were in sin, we loved it. We loved going. You can tell I've never done that before. Just watching Dragnet, okay? What Budweiser is good stuff. Oh, I love Budweiser. <laughs> my daddy told you, Sterling, my daddy told you, and I just about, I about wept. We was on our way down to go deer hunting, and my daddy said to you, Sterling, if God hadn't delivered me from be drinking beer, I'd be dead now. And I waited years for my daddy to say that. Because my daddy loved beer and wouldn't give it up. Never saw him drunk, but boy, he could drink a lot of beer. And God finally took it away from him. But it took a long time. I mean a long time. And to hear my daddy say that. So what happened was he started hungering and thirsting for something different. Righteousness. I don't want to do those things anymore. I want to do these things. Now God, I don't know how to do that. So God, you'll have to do it in me. And that's what God's plan is. He changes. I, I remember the day that I said... I want an olive. And all my life, I hated olives. Hated olives. Wouldn't eat pizza mom and daddy made because they put olives on it. I ate the crust, and that was it. But I remember a day after I got married, I went, I want an olive. <laughs> they were good. What happened? Something in me clicked. Something in me changed. And all of a sudden, I like olives. See, that's, that's how it works. Let me explain it genetically. 
In your genes is everything that you are or going to be. Okay? So, Ron, when you were 15, did you have a good crop up here? Okay. It was already written into your DNA that at some point we're going to let go of it. About 16. Okay. Hey, my Uncle John, he, in his 20s, he's gray headed. And we just noticed that. He was just silver headed as a young man. Okay. But that was in his genes. At some, and, we, and it's not explained yet. But in your genetics, everything that your body turns up to be. Sometimes it waits years to do it, but you went from a boy or a girl to a young man and a young woman in just a matter of a few months because something in your genes activated all that stuff that goes along with that. Remember, see how that works? See, this Bible is full of things that God is going to do in you when the time is right. Would it be good for three-year-old girls to start developing? No. Too many predators out there. Okay? So God fixes it at just the right time. Okay? For it to be dangerous. Okay? But he fixes it at just the right time. And everything about your body, even the change of your taste. You grow up. You don't eat the food you ate when you was a kid. You eat adult food now. You can eat asparagus. Right? That's how it works. That's how hunger and thirsting. This is what I'm telling you. God changes your thirst and your hunger. You don't change it. God does. God does. Amen? Then it says, blessed are what? Merciful. For they shall obtain mercy. God included it in his law of salvation that if you want to be forgiven, what must you do? Forgive. So here's what God's doing now in your life. He's growing you and he's teaching you See that, see that guy you've been mad at for years? Just cool it. And God, again, it's like God changing your taste to where you want olives. God does it. God changes you and all of a sudden you love that man that you hated. Or you have pity on someone and mercy on someone that's done you wrong. And you can forgive them. And who does that in you? It's a blessing when God does it. Have you ever had that happen? You just, one day, you just stopped hating somebody and said, you know what, I forgive the guy. That was God that did that. Will he do it again? That's what I'm telling you. So you start forgiving others. And by the way, you, you start now looking at sinful people saying, God, please have mercy on them. God, please don't let, God, don't let my husband die and go to hell. God, don't let my children go to hell. God, don't let my neighbors die and go to hell. That you start thinking that way. You have mercy on them. Okay? What's the next one? Blessed are the pure in heart. I asked Brother George. Brother George has been in church 50 years, he says. And I kind of know some of his background a little bit. And I know where he came from. And this is the reason why I asked him that. Have you ever seen fake and phony Christians? Yes. And George has been in, like we have, fundamental Bible-believing church, all for, for what I, from what I know of him, most of his life, if not all of his life, is Christian life. But I'm telling you, there's fakes in there. They're in there to be seen. There's fake preachers that are there to be seen, and for everybody to think they're really something. But they're a fake, and they're a phony, and you can tell because they're not virtuous in their motives. Why do you come to church? Do I make you? To keep your salvation or do you just come because you want remember i preached on your will you want to be here why do you read your bible you want to read your bible why do you pray you want to pray why do you tell somebody about jesus because you want to do it why do you turn away from sin because you want to do it god starts purifying your motives blessed are the pure in heart for they are going to get to see God who no man has ever seen. Think about it. Has any man ever seen God? Moses came the closest and he shone like the sun for weeks. Saw his back. But you can't see God because it'll kill you. 
The glory will kill you, blow your brain up. But one of these days, God's going to change us so that we can see God. And that's a blessing. But only, only if he can purify your heart. So then, what's the next one? Blessed are the... All right. When you were lost, you were at war with God. You were fighting God. You were losing. So now... It's just like blessed are the merciful. You start looking at people in a different light. You want to be a peacemaker between them and God. You know what that's called? Soul winning. You get a chance to talk to somebody about Jesus. You get a, ta you get a chance to witness to them. Why? Because you're wanting to be a peacemaker between them and God. See, here's God using you now. How did you get saved? Did somebody preach to you? Did somebody talk to you? Did somebody witness to you? Was there somebody involved in making you come to Jesus? Was somebody involved? Yes, yes, yes. There was somebody involved. God used that person to be a peacemaker. Didn't he? So, we lead people to Christ and we're going, wow. Because I'm telling you, there is no greater feeling than to know that God used you to lead somebody to Jesus. I mean, the first time I experienced that, I'm going, Woo-hoo! Amen! This is awesome! I'm never going to sin again! <laughs> Pride. She gets it. Now watch this. Then, so now pride's come in. And how does God rid us of pride? Look at the next verse. Blessed are they which, what? Persecuted. Whether it's humans that do it, or devils that do it, or both. God allows it. Why? Because it breaks the pride of our heart. Blessed are they which are persecuted... For righteousness sake. Now, now Peter teaches all on this in 1 Peter. And he teaches the difference between being persecuted for righteousness sake or being persecuted because you've been bad and God's whipping you with those people. God's using those people to beat the daylights out of you. To beat sin out of you. And that's part of it. But whether, whether it's for sin or for righteousness, God is allowing persecution now to break your pride because you thought... because. You led people to Jesus. You're God's chosen man. And then we get this, I could call it the Israel effect. We are the chosen people of God. We can do no wrong. And God hates it. Jesus hates it. He said in, if he, in Revelation, in the first three chapters, twice he mentioned the doctrine of the Nicolaitans and the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Nico means to conquer, like a king conquers somebody. Laetanes are the laity, the people sitting in the pews. And it's the idea that the clergy are the chosen men of God who, never do, who can do no wrong, think no wrong, say no wrong, and you must do what they tell you to do. And Jesus said, I hate them. I absolutely hate them. I despise them. So then, now we have a double blessing. Verse 11, number 9. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So watch this. God will, here's what God will do. God will bring you back down. Now, if it's for sin... Or even if it's for righteousness, God is going to bring you back down. Now, let's go back to verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Where are you back to now? Poor in spirit, bankrupt. See, what happens is you led somebody to the Lord. And the first thing that goes into our heart is the pride of I did it. I did it. I preached the message that 
people got blessed by. And preachers are the worst at it. I'm telling you. Because we're the ones up here that can say all this stuff and talk and teach and give, make illustrations and stir people up with our actions and our words. And it is easy for us to get this I'm the chosen man of God syndrome. So when you see me and I'm not all that, God's broken me back down. Probably because he used me to do some great thing and he knows I'll get arrogant about it and cocky about it and brag about it and everything else and he's got to bring me back down. Then when I realize I didn't do it because I'm bankrupt, then he starts blessing again. And the cycle starts all over again. And this continues until the day Christ appears in the air. Now, if it stops, you're in trouble. If it stops, it's because you didn't want to accept the persecution. And what is the persecution for? Turn to Hebrews 12. Let me, let's read this from the beginning. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Remember the clouds from this morning? Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. He's talking to Christian people, isn't he? He's telling us to lay the sins down. And let us run the race with what? Patience. If you're running, if you're going to run a 50-yard dash, do you start out slow? No. You've only got 50 yards to prove you got it. If you're going to run a 26 mile you start out slow you better because you're gonna run out of gas quick and you run that race and you see most people there I don't run but most people that run marathons know that they're not gonna win because the Kenyans always win <laughs> Ethiopians and the Kenyans get it every time okay but why do they run anyway it's 1,000 people run Boston Marathon. Why do they do it? To finish. To say, I finished. So who's going to get to heaven first? Christ already has. He's beat every one of us. So does it matter now who gets there first? Because second place is first loser. Right? Isn't that what they say? So it doesn't matter who gets there first now. Christ already got there. And he's just waiting on us to finish. So finish it. Amen. Amen. Then look verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. The cross was his persecution. He was persecuted for righteousness sake. Did he do anything wrong? No. They killed him anyway. Christ is our example in this. Look beyond the cross at the glory that's on the other side of it and you'll go through this. You'll say, I'll do it. I'll do it. That's what Christ did. He endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For considering him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your mind. And you can say, oh, brother, Mike, but you don't know my situation. It's terrible. Oh, where I live, it's awful. And the people around me are just, oh, they're terrible people. You just don't understand. He's right there. He tells you. Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. You ain't got it no worse than anybody else has ever had it, including Christ. God will get you through it. Verse 4, you have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. You haven't shed blood for your sins yet, have you? You haven't, you haven't shed blood to die yet, have you? 
Verse 5, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not now the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, and he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Whether you're persecuted for righteousness' sake or you're just getting kicked in the rear end because you had it coming, now God's got you to the point where he can say, blessed are the poor in spirit. I will give you the kingdom of heaven. You don't deserve it, but I'm going to give it to you anyway because that's how much he loves us. Amen? So then he says, in verse 7, if you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? Just ask my children if I ever chastened them. Ask them. They'll tell you. Yep. Daddy got me. And he said, but if you be without chastisement, whereof all the partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. You're not a son of God. You're a fake. You fell out. You let the pride of what you were doing get to you. And you won't let God bring you down. So I'm going to give up on you. Remember the tree that Jesus saw that bore no fruit, Gary? What did he do to it? Cursed it. Can you be cursed and blessed at the same time? Nope. So what happened to the tree that day? Boom. Boom. Never seen that before in my life where a tree is alive in the morning and dead as a doorknob the same day. But that's what happened to that tree. Okay? And that's what happens to people who are not, who refuse to be pure in heart. Who refuse to be peacemakers. Who refuse to be all the things that we just talked about. They, they cut out of those cycles. They get up here, they think they're going to stay up there, and they try to maintain it on their own merits, their own works, their own labor, whatever it, whatever it is. They try it, and they refuse to let God bring them down. So now, they are clouds without water. And there's no hope for them. The Bible speaks of people as being twice dead. And the term bastard here is a legal term. In olden days, when the inheritance actually meant something t because of titles, if you were a disinherited son, you were given the term bastard, bastardo in Spanish, you were given that term and legally you could not lay claim to the inheritance. It's a legal term, and it's a curse word, right? We, don't, we just don't say that. We don't call people that. But that's a legal term with God. If you will not let him chasten you as a father should, he disinherits you. You are a bastard. You are not his son, and you're not getting the inheritance. You're not going to heaven. Legally, you're not going. So do the cycles, do they benefit us? Do they help us? Do they bless us? Should we continue in those things? Even if it gets hard. And it's about to. I mean, we was talking after church. We, we, see, we're running scenarios in our mind about what's going to happen. What, so why are we buying all these bullets? Because we think something's fixing to break loose. Okay? Like phone calls. Okay, that's Antifa calling us. By the way, it's true. It's true. We've done it. If you go to www.antifa.com, takes you to Joe Biden's website. Try it. I'm telling you. And I, if if that was, see, I don't understand it. If that was a hack, they should have already undone the hack by now. That tells you what side he's on. True, true thing. You think he's disinherited? 
So God says they're twice dead. They're already have received, written down, that they are certified the second death is awaiting them. And there is no chance, no chance that that will ever change. I don't want God to do that to me. Amen? So there's your cycles right there. Re read those again sometime. Read them again. Read them again. Read them again. Read them again. Because that's how your life is going to go. It's how it's been. It's how it's going to go. Okay? All right. I was going to preach today out of Second Chronicles. God showed me something this morning about it. And I'm not going to do it. But what is a pardon? That's a legal term as well. What is a judicial pardon? Okay. Who gives it? A governor can do it. Or the president. They gave him the power. Now, what that means is, a part, you cannot give a pardon to somebody who's not been adjudicated and found guilty. That's, that's not a pardon. Okay? It means that you are already guilty and have been judged guilty and the king or the authority judicially removes away from you the wrath of the law that is against you and you will not be held criminally liable for your sins even though you did it it means you are free and once you're pardoned can anybody undo that? Can they come and haul you back in and say, you know what, you're supposed to be in jail? Can't do it. You ponder that this week. If you've been pardoned, you think about that this week. Okay? Let's stand. Man, I love this Bible. I love this Bible. Brother Wayne Dinwiddie called. He's come here to fill in for me. He's pastoring out there at Lake of the Ozarks. And he blessed me today. He said his church asked him, can we have revival? And he said, it wasn't even in my mind. He said, my church is asking me. And they said, we want, we want Pastor Mike to start it off. We want him to, to wow us with that Bible stuff that he does. And that blessed me. It really did. For a church to ask me to come and say, will you start us in revival by showing us great and mighty things from the Word of God? What a blessing that is. So that's why you'll see me down because you can get a high off of that. You can go, wow, I'm really something. Everybody wants me. Okay? And that's not good. Ask my wife. It's not good. Father, I love you and I love this book. I love this book. Thank you for it. I can't thank you enough for how you've enriched and blessed my life. How you let me be a blessing to my wife, my children, and to all these good people here, and to other pastors that I know. God, who am I? Thank you, God, for bringing me down in the dumps. Thank you for doing that for me. I need it. And Father, I look forward, God, to rising up, serving you once again, being a blessing to other people. Father, help me to even now to be a blessing to somebody. Thank you, God, for your word. Father, help us, dear God, to ask and to wait. To ask and to wait. Because that's our trust in you. That shows that we do trust you. And we only trust you. And that's why you do it. 
Thank you, God, for being so good to us. We love you, and we ask your blessing in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. And get out of here.